All right, everybody. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and get started. The uh, presentation, supposedly, this is as bright as it can get due to the video. Uh, so if anything's hard to see, just let me know, call out, and uh, we'll walk through it. Um, so my name's Keith Stakes. I'm a research engineer with UL, a colleague of Robin that you heard from this morning. I've been doing fire research now for about five years after my uh, bachelor's and master's in uh, fire protection engineering at the University of Maryland in the States. I also have uh, 12 years of fire service experience. Uh, I currently serve as a captain uh, with the fire department just outside of Washington, DC. Uh, so today we're gonna talk a little bit more focused than what Robin talked about this morning. Uh, this is on one of our projects focusing on suppression. So looking at interior and exterior attack, what does that mean to our victims inside the building, if there are any, and then what does that mean to us as firefighters? So what are we gonna do? Why are we here? What brought us to this point? Why did we do this project? What does the project include? Uh, the project has three components to it, air entrainment, water distribution, and uh, full-scale fire experiments, where you'll see that we built two full-size residential houses and uh, burned them each 30 times. So why are we here? We know that in the fire service, again, a lot of this presentation, I'll apologize up front, is a US focus. So keep that in mind as we go through the uh, the units are going to be U.S. units, so gallons per minute, Fahrenheit, so on and so forth. Uh, but in the fire service, there is very little fire behavior taught throughout, the, throughout an individual's fire service career. As they go through initial firefighter training, they get a couple hours, and that's pretty much it. Uh, there's never anything tying fire behavior to tactics, so again, that's something we try to do. And then the question is, does experience fill the gap? And we know that uh, throughout the world, fires are declining. We're not able to get as much experience as we did in the past. And therefore, we need research to try and build this gap between experience and uh, what we're seeing. Project funding, again, uh, in the States, all of our work is funded through the Department of Homeland Security uh, and the Assistance to Firefighters Grants Program. We apply for a grant each year on a given topic, and then they give us a certain amount of money to be able to conduct the research. So again, you've heard about us for quite some time. We've been doing fire research for firefighter research for over 10 years, uh, looking all the way back to 2006, focusing on structural stability. So we have new uh, building construction. What does this do? How does this impact collapse? Uh, going all the way up, looking at basement fires, different types of ventilation, vertical ventilation, more commonly used in the States, horizontal ventilation, positive pressure ventilation. And then uh, 2013, that's, uh, what we're presenting on here is the culmination of that study. So it's a study focused specifically just on suppression. Uh, then we take it a step further. We're just wrapping up 2014, which is the training study. Uh, in that, we're taking a look at different training uh, containers and how you line them and how that impacts fire behavior. And then 2015, we just kicked off two weeks ago. Uh, this is a project where we're trying to take everything and put it together. So this is going to be... Uh, Quite a lengthy process with a lot of people involved trying to say what lessons have we learned so far and how can we make the best coordinated fire attack. So taking away research takeaways, again this is some of the stuff that Robin touched on this morning. Forcing the doors ventilation, we know we want to control that, keep that in mind in our operations. Ventilation does not always equal cooling. We know the benefits of a closed door. Again, flow paths are crucial for basement fires, especially in the States. We don't want to operate going down the stairs, it's the chimney. Uh, coordination of ventilation and suppression. We know they need to be coordinated, we just don't necessarily know how. Uh, fire attacks should take place on the level of the fire, uh, specifically leading to basement fires. And then again, transitional attack. In the United States though, some of these are well adopted, some of them are not. In the United States, people tend to agree on the first four. But then there's a lot of disagreement and there's a lot of argument on the last three. So what does this boil down to? It boils down to water application. We as UL have never done a study focused specifically on suppression. We've always done studies on ventilation, on structural collapse, on building construction, material flammability, but never anything looking at water application. And the water application that we have done is just because we need to put the fires out. So if we're studying ventilation, we light a fire, we need to put the fire out. That's how we found out about transitional attack. We're researchers, we're not gonna go in the building, we're just gonna put water in. Oh, look how successful it is. Uh, but we've never done anything on interior attack and never done anything comparing them. So hence the outstanding arguments. 
<clears throat> some of the things we still hear in the States. Uh, exterior fire attacks going to push fire. We're going to steam our victims and we're going to make them lobsters. Uh, exterior fire attack is delaying our time to get to the victims. So in the United States, there's a very heavy victim focus. Uh, so in the United States, most of the firefighters, they say that they're there for the victim. They're not there for themselves. They place the victim above themselves. And that's something that we have to consider in our research with the mentality and how they carry out their tactics. And then again, need to attack from the unburned side. So what does this mean? Well, that means we need a study focused on suppression. We haven't done that yet. And we need to compare interior and exterior. And what does that mean not only to the victims, but to us and where we are on the fire ground? So again, project workflow, we're just wrapping that up. The study is actually coming out December 6th. It's going to be publicly released. Uh, we're going to have a, several reports to go along with that, as well as an online training program uh, to carry you through the process and everything we learned. Project technical panel, once again, these are US-funded grants, so a lot of the stuff is US-based uh, US tactics. We gather fire service experts from across the country with a couple international influence to try and guide us on what they want to see. They say, we still have questions about this. We don't believe you when you say this. Uh, we see this happen. What does it mean? Why does it happen? And then they go and provide their input. And the experiments are generally all designed by the input of the panel members that we put together. So fire attack study. We start getting into the actual study itself. We wanted to take a look at the components of water suppression uh, separate from fire. So starting out with air entrainment testing uh, in the United States, you know, we have a couple different nozzles, a couple different ways to apply water. How do those nozzles and hose streams move air? So we need to know that before we put that into a fire situation and say, okay, what is the impact of the fire behavior or what is the impact of just our hose stream? Then we want to look at water distribution. We all generally have thoughts. If we come up to a window and there's fire showing out of the window and I apply water in the ceiling, everybody has an idea of what happens. But we need to take a look at that without fire involvement to see actually what does happen, what can we confirm, what can we dispute. And then again, we take both of those pieces, put them together, and then do full-scale fire experiments where we take a look at interior and exterior attack, flow path, uh, victim hazards and firefighter hazards, uh, and suppression tactics. Victim hazards, you'll see Robin will be in here in a little while. Uh, he's going to chime in a little bit later in the presentation regarding our victim hazards and burn injuries. So one thing that was unique about this project is we used pig skins. Uh, so he'll be talking to you about how to make bacon uh, based on our tactics. But we'll start out with air entrainment. So we all know nozzles move air. But again, it's a matter of perspective, just like Robin touched on this morning. Uh, we've all heard that you can push fire. Most places in the United States, you're taught about hydraulic ventilation which is showing you that your host stream can move air and entrain air based on how you use it. But that's never talked about and compared to when you're actually doing suppression. So if I'm going down a hallway and I have a fog stream, why is that any different than taking my fog stream and putting it out a window? I'm still entraining air, so what does that mean when I'm doing a suppression action? How do those two compare? What does that mean? And then again, what does it do for the victims? So with that, we set out to design some experiments, and uh, we have a great video guy that we stole from the Los Angeles County Fire Department, and uh, he takes all of our experiments, puts everything together, and uh, makes it look real sexy, makes the numbers look a little bit better, and uh, he'll give you a teaser on uh, what we did in these experiments. My name is Robin Zavotek with the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute. We're here at the Delaware County Emergency Services Training Center testing airflow entrainment in nozzles. My name is Jerry Knapp. I'm a training officer in Rockland County, New York Fire Training Center. Uh, this nozzle testing that UL is doing is, is very important. Uh, we know house fires are controlled by the amount of air that, that's, uh, that's allowed in the house. Uh, what we don't know is what our fire streams are doing to that air entrainment. Are they pushing a lot of air in or what are, what are they doing to the fire? 
so this uh, measuring the airflow caused by nozzles uh, will be a major part of uh, uh, learning how we control house fires in the future. Our tests today are looking at how the different nozzle patterns, the different types of nozzles, and the different uh, application techniques are going to move either more or less air. I'm Keith Stakes, a research engineer with the Firefighter Safety Research Institute, and I also am a volunteer lieutenant with the Bethesda Chevy Chase Rescue Squad. We are working through a series of different nozzles at different hose line sizes uh, to cover basically what the technical panel uh, sees out in the field. Each department uses a different type of nozzle to flow a different amount of water at a different pressure, and we want to make sure we cover all of those uh, to get the most realistic results as possible. Today we're measuring airflow through the use of bi-directional probes. Our probes are connected to a pressure transducer which takes a pressure signal and changes it into an electrical signal which runs back to our data system. We're using five different probes today at two different ranges to try and determine the total airflow that's moved by the nozzle. My name is Josh Hummel, um, a firefighter with Howard County Fire Rescue in Maryland. As far as the, the experience up here, it's been pretty interesting. These guys are uh, definitely utility players, uh, do uh, a little bit of everything. Uh, some of the data is pretty interesting. We're even finding some, some, some differences between whether it's open environment or when they've been testing moving down the hallway with how much air entrainment's been there. So that should give you a good kind of overview of what we did. Uh, again, we tested interior and exterior streams. We varied the hose line sizes. So again, common in the United States, inch and three quarters, your primary attack line. If you see a lot of fire, the common go-to is to go to a two or a two and a half inch line. Uh, hose stream types, that just means smooth bore, straight stream, narrow fog, or wide fog, as we define them. Uh, spray patterns, that's how we're actually going to apply the water, uh, whether we apply it with a fixed stream, a sweeping stream, uh, very common in the United States is to do a wall ceiling wall. So we want to coat our surfaces and then we could make that an O if we want to to sweep the floor. And then again, test nozzle manufacturers. So we're focused on air entrainment here and then again later water distribution. We want to make sure the construction of the nozzle also doesn't change the results. So we wanted to look at a variety of different manufacturers as well. Uh, did close to 80 experiments. And again, you saw very briefly in the video, Jerry Knapp. He's a uh, training officer from uh, the state of New York and he did a bunch of early experiments into air entrainment and this is building off of that to try and further clarify and provide some additional research. This was the structure. Again the structure was already in existence prior to us doing the testing. Uh, back when I worked for NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology under Dan Madrakowski, if you've heard of him, uh, this structure was built to resemble a uh, row home in the Washington DC area uh, on Cherry Road. If you guys have heard of the Cherry Road incident, it's where two firefighters lost their lives in a basement flow path issue. And so this structure was built specifically for that to replicate the basement and again the first floor of that. So this was already in existence. We needed to modify it and be able to make it usable for us. Uh, conveniently enough, the basement was an open floor plan. You'll see it here uh, with a staircase that goes up to the second floor or first floor, however you want to call it, basement first or first second. Uh, double open door on both the first floor and the second floor here, so we wanted to keep the openings on the same side. Again, we're testing out in the open environment, so we need to be considerate of how wind effects are going to come into play and environmental uh, effects. So we try and keep the openings on the same side of the building, made sure our testing occurred when there wasn't any wind, and uh, monitored the weather conditions throughout. Uh, you see here at the top of the staircase, bi-directional probe array. Uh, you heard in the video briefly, bi-directional probe, it's how we're measuring uh, differential pressure. When you combine that with the temperature, you can get a flow out the other end. And uh, we place those at the top of the stairs. So all of our flow actually occurred on the ground floor here, whether it be from the inside out or the outside in. And our measurements were taking place at the top of the stairs. We needed our measurements to be out of the reach of the host stream to avoid moisture and so on and so forth. 
So if we were inside flowing out, we wanted to see how much air we were drawing in behind us. If we were flowing outside in, we wanted to see how much air we were moving into the building. Nozzles utilized. So this goes back to our technical panel. They tell us what they use in the field, and we need to make sure we capture as broad of a spectrum as that as we can. Again, English units here, and you guys probably are astonished, but know at the amount of water that we typically use and that we carry. Uh, but we tested anything from an inch and three quarter line on a smooth bore uh, all the way up to a two and a half inch line on a larger smooth bore flowing anywhere between 100 GPM and 320. Again, fairly common for us during fire attack. Nozzle prop, you saw it briefly in the video, but uh, in order to make these experiments repeatable, but also realistic, we need some sort of combination between uh, manual operation via a firefighter and also fixed to eliminate uh, nozzle reaction. So this is actually how the device was used. It was constructed to simulate a backup firefighter to alleviate the nozzle reaction and hold the hose in a fixed position further back. There is still enough hose at the beginning to be able to manipulate the hose in whatever fashion we needed to based on the test. So calculation of CFM, again, just briefly touching on this, this is how we uh, went about getting our final results. Uh, don't pay attention to the data specifically with this chart, but this is how you're going to look at the charts further. So again, CFM. On the bottom, we're looking at our time of duration during the experiment. On the y-axis there, we're looking at our total cubic feet per minute. And the vertical lines that you see throughout, those are different events that occurred during the experiment. So again, starting out with a background period, that's where we're not flowing any water. We need to see what the environmental conditions are as we start and then we go ahead and make that our zero, and from that point forward, we go ahead and see the results as we do various tactics. You'll see moving forward that they will be reported out in the form of a bar chart, which is the average of the data across the minute period in which a tactic was done. So again, straight stream, then we go to a moving straight stream, narrow fog, and then a moving fog. So we'll see that as we go forward. This is how the charts will look as you see them, but this is just to briefly touch on measurement uncertainty. Again, we have uncertainty with this due to environmental effects, due to how we apply the water, uh, due to the equipment itself and differences in that. So we need to take that all into consideration when we're looking at our results. Uh, based on our uncertainty, we apply that via the error bars that you see on the chart. So for our understanding, anything that lies within the error bars of one another, we can't say is different. So to the chart, you may say, OK, yes, straight stream in a Z, I'm seeing 5,000 with that flow and pressure, and straight stream Z with that flow and pressure, I see over six. But based on how we measure it and how the uncertainty falls out, I can't say those are different. So to us, because the error bars line up with one another, that means they're the same. So we first need to take a look at manufacturer. If we find out that the manufacturer doesn't have a difference, then we're going to go forward with one manufacturer. If we find out that the manufacturer has a difference, then we need to design a whole bunch more tests, get some more money, and look into this further. <clears throat> but as we would expect, we're not seeing differences between the manufacturer. So taking a look at the chart on the left, that's looking at a combination nozzle. So that's one where we can go from a straight stream all the way up to a wide fog. And then on the right, looking at a smoothbore nozzle where we just have a fixed solid stream. During this test, you can see we did a straight stream fixed, a straight stream in an O. We widened the pattern to a narrow fog and then took that fog and moved it in an O. All things that are fairly commonly done during suppression in the United States. Average CFM that you're seeing, based on how we conducted the tests and the amount of water that we're flowing, again, you see here 150 GPM at 100 PSI, fairly standard for us, uh, seeing about 1 to 2,000 for a straight stream, also a smooth bore. Again, we would expect this. The streams are fairly similar. As you start to move the stream, one thing that's interesting is as you take a straight stream and move it in an O pattern, you start to get results that look fairly similar to, an, to a narrow fog, even fixed. When we take that narrow fog and start to move that into no pattern, again, we're increasing the entrainment. So we're starting to build on our conclusions here about what happens when you do certain things. But looking at our error bars throughout the experiments, we're not able to see major differences between the manufacturers and the construction of the nozzle because they all rate them to be a certain flow at a certain pressure. So we're going to go ahead and use that as a conclusion and move forward with one manufacturer for the rest of the test. Taking a look at what we call total entrainment. Again, we haven't figured out a way to measure air entrainment out in the open, which would be ideal. We have to use some sort of enclosure to be able to measure the air entrainment, at least in how we set it up. 
So the structure has somewhat of an impact, but just keep that in mind as we go forward. We used a very large open volume. We're not hitting the stream off of a surface. The stream is going out an opening or in an opening. So the stream is not impacted at all. Uh, it's going out or in an opening. Here is where we wanted to take a look at the different flows and pressures based on the type of nozzle, uh, both for a combination and a smooth bore. And again, we did fairly uh, similar tactics. We held a straight stream fixed. We did a straight stream in an OZN. So in the United States, those are all very common. Just depends on what department you're a part of. You're either taught you need to move it in an O, a Z, a T. You know, they talk about, okay, I need to hit the gases up high, then go to the fuel. This is where they get these different shapes from. Uh, then we go to a narrow fog. We widen the stream, hold it fixed, and then again, go ahead and move the fog in an O. <clears throat> Some interesting things to see once again. Moving a straight stream around, even though it's a straight stream, generates a lot of airflow on the order of 6,000 CFM or so based on what we calculated. And then again, similar but a little bit less magnitude for a smooth bore. Again, it's a little bit tighter of a stream, but once you start moving it, it breaks it up. Nozzle movement. So we also wanted to take a look at rotation speed. All of the experiments that you saw just in the previous tests were done at 100 revolutions a minute, which is fairly common for the United States pulling people throughout, this is how much they move. Uh, we actually took a metronome and put it into earphones for the nozzle operator, and so they were rotating once every click. Uh, we, w we did uh, 50, 100, and 150. 50 was fairly easy. 100 was fairly standard. It was fairly uh, easy to do as well. And then 150 I could barely keep up with. Um, the tests were only a minute long based on what we were doing. Uh, but 150 I could barely keep up with. So we stopped at 150 and said that that's not, uh, nobody would be going any faster than that. Uh, again, this was done with a smoothbore nozzle in an O pattern because we're looking at rotations. And then we wanted to say, okay, what if I don't have a fixed pattern? <clears throat> so what if I compare my O pattern to just somebody that opens up the nozzle and just goes like this in whatever manner they can? If they're generally the same speed, we're seeing the same amount of air entrainment. Again, you're moving the nozzle, you're breaking up the stream, you're getting the same kind of phenomena. Positive pressure comparison. This is going back to the research that UL did previously on positive pressure ventilation and positive pressure attack. If you take a look at some of the flow calculations that they did using the fans during fire suppression, you first start looking at the exhaust to inlet ratio. So if I have a one to one exhaust to inlet or if I have a two to one exhaust inlet, I can generate anywhere between 8,600 and 14,000 CFM with a fan. Now, if we go back to the charts that we just looked at previously, excuse me, those numbers are fairly comparable to what we can do with a nozzle. So again, these are drawing bigger conclusions out of this, uh, saying I can compare my air that's being moved by a hose stream with a fan. So that's something very significant to uh, keep in mind. Again, takeaways for these pieces here. Uh, we're not seeing differences in nozzle manufacture in air entrainment. Again, entrainment increases with increasing nozzle movement. So as I move the nozzle faster, I'm getting more air entrainment. Uh, increases in air entrainment with increasing hose stream type. So smooth bore being the smallest, straight streams a little bit wider, a little bit more broken up, so on and so forth, all the way to wide fog. Uh, entrainment roughly the same with any application pattern. So it doesn't matter whether I do a T, a Z, an N, whether I just move the nozzle around. If it's the same speed, you're getting the same amount of entrainment. And then lastly, important takeaway is I can move as much air with my nozzle as a fan can. So this, these are things that we need to build upon and start putting into our fire suppression operations and say, if I'm going down the hallway with a fog nozzle and I'm moving it like this, I know I'm moving a hell of a lot of air. What does that mean to the fire? What does it mean to fire behavior? So a lot of these things are things that you probably say, yeah, I know this, but we haven't found any testing and we needed to do the testing to put the numbers to it. We're putting all the pieces together in building blocks before we actually get to do the fire experiments. So with that, we say, what are some training opportunities we can do? Uh, you guys have burn buildings or containers around. This could be a rep, uh, replicate of a container. It's basically a room, and then there's a hallway attached to it. Doesn't need to be in that shape, but basically if you're putting a hose into a window or putting a hose into a door, at the other end, just put a piece of black wire and then put a bunch of survey tape that they use during construction, and you can get an idea of airflow. You're not getting values. You're not getting magnitudes of this but you can get a good idea based in change. He widens it to a narrow fog, the streamers start to move more, it starts to get these ideas in people's heads. 
Uh, with that, we go to water distribution. We say we know how much air our nozzles are in training. Now we're going to build on that and say, where does our water go? <clears throat> Again, where does our water go? Does a transitional attack cause the water to deflect off the ceiling like a sprinkler head? We've always thought going into this that if I'm going to go up to a window that has fire coming out of it, I'm going to get up, get low. I'm going to keep my stream very high. I'm going to keep it fixed. It's going to hit the ceiling and deflect off like a sprinkler. That's what, that's what I was taught. That's what many people were under... Uh, understanding of. Does that happen? What's the best method to code all surfaces within a compartment? Again, in the States, surface cooling is very important for us, so that's something we wanted to look at. And then again, what's the best angle to apply this? So with that, again, we set out to do some testing and uh, another little video to explain that to you. Keith Stakes here with the Firefighter Safety Research Institute. We're here today in Northbrook at UL's headquarters conducting water mapping experiments within structures. We are looking at where water goes within a room from both interior and exterior fire attack. Firefighters across the country apply water into structures very differently using different nozzle techniques, different applications, and different patterns. We were able to study over 80 experiments to try and determine how those different techniques affect how water is distributed inside a room. I'm Adam Barrowy. I'm a research engineer in UL's Fire Research and Development Group. This week, we're using UL's actual delivered density apparatus, otherwise known as the ADD apparatus, to measure uh, hose stream flow rates. Typically, this device is used to help sprinkler manufacturers design sprinklers by knowing where the water is sprayed during a sprinkler activation. So this week, we're just using hose streams and measuring the water by collecting it in these funnels which run down into barrels which are connected to pressure transducers which ultimately allow us to calculate out flow rates within a given area. My name is Kelly Hannock. I'm a lieutenant with the Eden Prairie Fire Department in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. It's interesting to see how we're um, repurposing equipment that UL had to gather new data that we haven't had to help us in our understanding of what's happening on the fire ground. Uh, my name is Tony Carroll. I'm with the Washington, D.C. Fire Department. And it's really interesting to see where the water is going. Um, I think it's showing us uh, some of the things that we thought was happening and also showing us some things that, that we didn't think that where water was going to go. And I think we can use the information to come up with some, some findings in our fire attack panel study. Modern fire research has really impacted our department uh, as well as the fire service across the country when it comes to how we do our jobs every day. We found that buzzwords like transitional attack, it's stuff that we've been doing for a long time and there just wasn't a lot of education and science out there to validate it and to explain why we were doing things that we did, why they worked or didn't work. And so in participating in this study and other research that's going on, it's really allowed our department to grow and evolve with the times while maintaining our traditional aggressive stance um, as an urban fire department. So 
So just as a heads up, the guys that you see in the video, uh, the men and women in the video, they're part of our technical panel. So it's anybody between the rank of firefighter all the way up to fire chief. They apply, they provide input for the project. So taking a look at our experiments, again, we wanted to do fairly similar to what we did with the air entrainment and how we tested. We want to look at interior and exterior streams or window versus door. I'll explain that here in a second as far as the setup. First floor versus second floor exterior streams. So what does it mean if I'm applying water at the grade of the fire versus one level below? Again, varying the same type of things here, hose line sizes, stream types, and spray patterns. Uh, looking at creative application methods. Uh, when we talk about bail positions, that's how far open or closed the nozzle is. Uh, deflection, meaning where I'm deflecting the water off of, doesn't always have to be the ceiling. And then again, what happens if we drop the pressure? Did a total of roughly the same amount of experiments, 82. And uh, we'll start by looking at the structure. So you saw in the video, we actually had to build the structure elevated, but it also provided us some benefits by being able to apply water from a floor below. Uh, we built the structure elevated because we used what's called an actual delivered density apparatus, uh, which collects the water in different barrels and allows us to uh, calculate out a given flow. But we have a general room size, uh, 17 foot by 11 foot, a little bit bigger than what you'd have in a master bedroom in the United States. Uh, we attached a hallway that was eight feet long by six feet wide. We put a doorway at the end of the hall to the room. So we have a hallway going into what we're calling a fire room. And then we have a uh, window on the outside of the compartment that would be our common size of an exterior window, two by four or something of the sort. Uh, we had a stair landing here. The stair can actually move from the hallway over to the window. So that allows us to make our window either first floor or second floor. Taking a look at the apparatus, again, for orientation, this is the exterior window here. This is looking from the doorway into the room. These are the collection barrels that we have and the room that was built around that. Taking a look at the side view, the barrels go down into a bin, uh, able to collect 30 gallons of water, and then uh, able to calculate out a flow. This is the schematic showing which bin in what area and how the computer program goes ahead and tells us that. So taking a look at the experiments then, we needed to break it down on how we were going to apply water based on where we applied it from. We started out by saying we we're going to apply water from the exterior through the window at the same grade as the fire. Uh, we wanted to look at a variety of different angles. If I can get up close to the window and I can keep my stream as uh, maximum as it possibly can, what does that look like? That's max angle ceiling. Mid ceiling means I drop it halfway back into the compartment, so about halfway back. Minimum angle ceiling, that's putting the stream on the ceiling as close to the wall as possible. So not on the wall, but as close. Uh, max angle wall would be on the wall as close to the ceiling as possible. And then at wall would just be uh, straight on at the wall across from you. Taking a look at a second floor attack now, we wanted to try and also test as many of the same angles as we could. We looked again at max angle ceiling, so very steep. Dropped it further into the room for mid ceiling, further into the room for minimum angle ceiling wall, max angle wall. And then lastly, when we're a floor below, I'm not able to get up even with the window, so I can't apply my stream directly perpendicular across from me. So what else could we do? This is where we said soffit. What we're referring to soffit is the top of the window frame. So as you go forward, that's what we're calling a soffit. What happens if we deflect the water off that? Uh, door attack. This would be from the interior hallway through a doorway into the room. Um, we wanted to look at a couple angles there as well. Steep, halfway back, and then straight across from you. Uh, so we called them interior and exterior streams, uh, whether it be from the window or from the door but we got a little bit of pushback from our technical panel. So again, they are designing these experiments. They're helping with the understanding through the fire service and what we should call things. They thought it would be of more benefit to call it window versus door attack. So to us, that doesn't matter. Fine, we'll call it window versus door. But their explanation is that if we call this an interior attack and we're looking at how the water is distributed, they're saying it's not accurate. And why are they saying that? Because they're saying that if I'm doing an interior attack, I'm gonna apply water into the room I'm going to cool the gases. I'm going to put out the majority of the fire, but then I'm actually going to enter into the compartment. And once I enter into the compartment, I'll be able to suppress anything that I need to. So what they wanted to see if we were going to call it interior attack was to show every single bin full. So if we do an interior attack, yes, you can go inside the room. You can fill up every single bin. So for understanding purposes, we just said, all right, door attack. We're at the doorway to the fire room. What does it look like based on how you apply water? 
this is a little schematic on how the results are going to be explained. So on the left here, you'll see our chart. It's oriented as close to the compartment as it possibly can be. So you see on this side of the chart here, this is what we're calling door side. So if I'm in the doorway looking into the room, those are the bins going that way. Window side here, the arrow shows you the way the water was applied. And then again, the information up here tells you what type of attack it was. It was using a straight stream, inch and three quarter hose. It was an attack from the first floor, which is why you see the staircase here. Uh, minimum angle ceiling, meaning I was uh, uh, fairly shallow into the room. And then again, in a fixed pattern, I'm not moving the stream. And then we have the results. So <clears throat> again, US units here, but the colors are gonna tell you how much water got into what bin. Starting out with less than 0 0.05 GPM per square foot. Why that's important to us in the States is based on the residential sprinkler density, which is stating that you need to have at least 0 0.05 GPM per square foot uh, coming out of your sprinkler system and that kind of coverage within the room. So then we can start comparing our results to say, is our host stream providing the same amount or greater or less coverage than a residential sprinkler? So anywhere where there's gray, we're not getting the coverage that a residential sprinkler would provide. Anything that's a different color, we're obviously getting uh, at or more. So starting with the first type of attack, smooth bore max angle fixed, meaning I'm using a smooth bore nozzle, I'm not moving it, and I have it as steep as I possibly can. What happens when I look at it going through the window versus the doorway? We start to see something very interesting off the bat. Again, this is what we would be calling exterior. This is what we'd be calling interior. We're seeing that we're not getting very much water into the middle of the room at all. So first test is completed. We're thinking, OK, what the hell is going on? If I apply a stream up here, I think it's going like this. What's happening? I see the same thing again, window versus the door. We know there's not much difference between the two, just the difference in the size opening. <clears throat> Taking a look now at a smooth bore uh, from both the first floor this time looking at angle. Max angle ceiling, meaning it's as steep as possible, and then what happens if I start to drop the nozzle further into the room? Here you can see that the nozzle is very steep. I'm getting water ahead of me, but the steeper it is, I'm also getting some water behind me now, which explains the perimeter coverage. As I start to drop the nozzle further into the room, more of the water is going ahead of me, and it's all collecting along the back wall. Now what happens if I'm doing a sweeping attack? So again, it's a two foot by four foot window, so it's very small. I'm not able to sweep very much, more from the first floor than the second. Uh, but we're taking a look at first floor versus second. So on the first floor, again, we see what we saw before. Even with a sweep, I'm not getting much more than perimeter coverage. When we start to look at a second floor, I'm starting to see a little bit better coverage. Now we're starting to try and wrap our head around this. Why is that? Well, one thing we're seeing, as you can see here, is that as the water goes in, we're flowing such high quantities of water at such a, what we would consider high pressure, that the momentum of the water is carrying across the surface and down the walls. Again, based on our size compartment, but these are very, fairly common for residential in the States. As we start to go from a first floor to a second floor, I now have a lot of distance between the end of the nozzle and where it's deflecting off the surface in the compartment. So my water is slower, therefore when it hits the surface, it's able to break up a little bit more, doesn't carry on the surface as much, and drops into the room. So starting to put the pieces together. This is the sweeping application. <clears throat> One thing that's a couple interesting things to point out, this again is from the corner. You see the doorway here, you see the window here. If we go back and start the video over again, in the very beginning you can see the water carry out. <clears throat> as the water comes over to this wall, the video gets a little bit cloudy. But one thing that was interesting to us is we were witnessing these tests, obviously, while we were there. If we were doing a door attack, we'd go up to the window and look in, see what we can see, and vice versa, window to the door. When you look in the room, it looks like there's water going everywhere. It looks like everything's getting covered, everything's getting soaked. But what we started to find out that it was just kind of this mist that was floating around that looked like everything was getting wet. We wanted to take a look at at wall then. Okay, what happens? We know from the states when we do an interior attack, sometimes we don't have a good backup person. Sometimes there's problems with the hose deployment. Sometimes I'm just holding on to the hose and it's open and I'm just going forward like this until I can get to the fire room. So that's where our at wall comes from. What's that look like? We see that our uh, perpendicular distribution on the wall gives us some splashback into the room, whether it be from the window or the door. You can see that here, once again, more perpendicular, more spread out in all directions. 
uh, fog. What happens if we open this up to a fog? One thing that's interesting is you can kind of see this uh, triangle distribution here. You can actually kind of pick up the cone in the distribution. So we can see that in this picture here, the cone carries into the room and the cone actually carries across then. Uh, whether it be from a window or a doorway, again, seeing the uh, fairly similar distribution, not much further back into the room. Uh, here we wanted to take a look at something we looked at in air entrainment. Does how we apply the water as far as application pattern matter? Uh, once again, we looked at inverted U. That's what we're calling wall ceiling wall or a method like this. Excuse me, O pattern, Z pattern, and T pattern. And again, we're doing this from the doorway as if we would be doing an interior attack coming towards the room. We don't see any difference in distribution uh, between the type of attack. So now, once again, we start going back and putting these things together. If I don't see anything, uh, differences in air entrainment, I don't see any differences in water distribution, what does that mean? Are the different patterns significant? Uh, we'll see. Creative methods, this is the second floor where we said, OK, what if we hit off the top of the window frame because we can't get further into the room? Well, now what do we see? We see a whole lot better distribution in the room. There's not as much in given areas, but there's fairly uniform coverage throughout the compartment. And again, inch and three quarter hose flowing our standard amount of water, holding it fixed. This is what it looks like. So then we go back to what we learned before. Why does this happen? Well, the surface that the water is carrying across is only the width of the window. So as soon as it goes past the window frame, it breaks off and goes into the room. <clears throat> So keep in mind, a lot of this, again, is dependent on your room size and how long the water is going to carry across the surface. But we tested what would be bigger than a master bedroom in a single family house in the States. So we're fairly confident that this is how water uh, acts within smaller compartments in the structure. Creative methods, now we're starting to get into things. How can we change our stream? How can we change how we're applying the water? How can we change what tactic we're using in order to get better distribution? <clears throat> So again, if I'm from the outside of the building and I go ahead and conduct a transitional attack, max angle, I'm flowing my stream inside the room, keeping it fixed, keeping it uh, as max as I possibly can, I know I'm going to coat all the surfaces. Again, for us, that's very important. We're going to coat the ceiling, coat all the walls, take the gases out of place, stop re-radiation in the room. But I notice that I'm not putting out the combustibles and the fuels that are in the middle of the room. We know in a bedroom, I'm going to have furniture along the walls, but I'm going to have a bed that sticks out into the middle. That's likely probably still going to be on fire if I had a fully involved room. How am I going to get that out from the outside? <clears throat> if I have a smoothbore nozzle, I can probably do that to, to half bale. On a smoothbore nozzle with a solid stream, if I go ahead and open that bale only halfway, it breaks up the stream, much like you'd see between a straight stream and a narrow fog for a combination nozzle, in which we get better distribution in the middle of the room. So now we can start to put this stuff together. OK, maybe I should go up and do a full bail to begin with. Once I see the fire darken down, I know I need some time in order to get in. Or if I'm only staying out and need to be able to complete suppression, maybe I crack it to half bail and do that. Now, what if I have a combination nozzle? Again, different things you can do. This we tried doing a straight stream first, followed by a fog. You could also do a straight stream followed by a straight stream uh, half bail. Uh, as a different option, but we chose to do a straight stream and, a, and then a fog in this specific test, uh, taking a look at the distribution. Again, we code our services first. We went to a fog, less momentum, more broken up stream, and we got better coverage in the room. Uh, we're not at all advocating that you should put a fog into a window. This is just saying this is what happens if you do as far as the distribution. So again, the takeaways, we touched on them some, uh, whether it be from the window or the doorway, fairly similar distribution as you would expect. A uh, steep angle provides the greatest surface coverage. Again, for us, that's very important, taking the gases out of play, uh, taking re-radiation of the wall materials out of play. Uh, difficult to get water into the middle of the room, and some creative methods help better in that, whether it be doing off the soffit or changing how your nozzle is applying the water. <clears throat> Training opportunities. This happens to be in the house that we burn, but you can do this in a burn building. You can do it in a container. Just keep in mind, if you do it in a container, the ceiling is going to be corrugated like this, so you're going to have different distribution. But just showing where the water goes. In the beginning of that video, as the water starts, you see it carry right to the walls and down. Again, down here, this is a, a room at the end of the hallway. The top left is the hallway. This is a bedroom at the very end. You can see that when I'm applying water in the hallway, it doesn't go into the room. Just something important to highlight. 
because water doesn't bend corners. It's like bullets. We can't take the water and go like this. I've got to get closer to get the water in the room. With that, <clears throat> we say we've looked at air entrainment. We know how our nozzles are moving air. We put those pieces together. We say now we know where water's going within the compartment. With that, we design our full-scale fire experiments and uh, go forward with that. We're here in Northbrook, Illinois at UL's large fire lab conducting our full-scale fire experiments for the fire attack study. This project centers around interior and transitional fire attack, looking at victim survivability in residential structure fires. Feeling good? Excited? All right. You're in one of the largest fire labs in the world. So what we have behind me is two 1,600 square foot houses that are meant to simulate the average of what you would have in the United States. And we're studying how firefighters fight fire. What we do is we sensor these buildings to make 250 readings in each one of these buildings to understand what is the actual best way to fight a fire. measuring temperature, heat flux, gas concentrations, uh, all of the things that could possibly kill occupants and also harm firefighters. We're gonna burn these houses 30 different times, looking at different methods to attack the fire to give the fire service the input that they're looking for to be more effective, to rescue more people, save more lives. The first two components of the fire attack study were studying how nozzles and train air, as well as looking at water mapping to see where water is distributed within a structure. Both hose streams and fires themselves move air throughout structures by pressure differentials which create flow. So if we focus in on the hose streams themselves, we can determine how our water application is affecting fire behavior during suppression operations and can help dictate which tactic to use in a given scenario. Additionally. Looking at where water goes within compartments can help us determine where to best direct the nozzle so we can obtain the most reach and coverage while seeing its impact on fire behavior during suppression. And this will be the second time that we've done experiment 20 and we will be able to compare that to the interior. We'll be able to compare it to one with straight stream, one with smooth bore, one with a fog, one with a stop and move, one with a flow and move. So you can see how all these variables come together so we can paint the full picture. It's all about What's going on? What are the firefighters doing? How is that impacting potential occupants that could be in the house? How is that impacting the fire? We've got our partners from the University of Illinois here. Uh, they bring some steam measurement to us. For the first time, we're able to do some new measurements to quantify the amount of moisture in the air during fires and after suppression using laser measurement systems. The second component that's new for us is trying to quantify the effect of firefighting operations and the fire itself on skin burns for potentially trapped occupants. So we've been able to develop a technique using uh, pig skin to measure the temperatures on the surface and subsurface that allows us to look at burn injury risk as well as heat transfer. Like all of our earlier projects, this project is increasing the knowledge in the fire service, putting data to tactics that have been used over the decades to better understand how each affects victim survivability in a structure. All right, so we'll hurry up and get through the intro as far as the setup goes <clears throat> and try to get through as much of the results as possible. We won't be able to cover all of them but want to at least get the information on moisture and skin burns out there to you guys. Uh, so again, we went over these questions that are still lingering, which is why we designed the experiments the way we did. Uh, these are what the structures look like. You saw a little bit of it in the video, but we had four bedrooms in the structure. We had a master bedroom, another bedroom that served as a fire room, and then we had these two bedrooms, which were an open and closed door comparison. So for all the experiments, this door was open to the bedroom, and for all the experiments, this door was closed. That gave us that comparison. Uh, we have a very long hallway here. Again, that was dictated by our technical panel. They said they wanted to see what happens if we're making an approach down a hallway using our different tactics. Living room here just in the entry door, and a dining room and kitchen in the back. 
instrumentation and video. Again, you know what we measure, temperature, gas concentrations, heat flux, moisture, skin burns, so on and so forth. Uh, we use both standard and thermal uh, imaging videos throughout. <coughs> Furnishings, we use a modern fuel load. Uh, so we are lucky enough to have a company nearby outside of Chicago that goes ahead into old hotels, not old hotels, but hotels takes out all the furniture and then gives them new furniture. So that's one way for us to be able to buy 40 of the same bed, 40 of the same couch, uh, and be able to get repeatability in our fuels. As far as the test plan goes, we did six experiments using an interior attack as we would define it in the United States with one room of fire at the end of a hallway. <clears throat> All other ventilation openings closed. We did another set of experiments where we had the same room of fire, but now we have the window open from the beginning, again using an interior attack. We did another set of experiments where we now have multiple rooms of involvement, and again, fire spreading down the hallway. So this is more like third involvement of the house. Um, again, looking at contents fires, it wasn't into the structure. Uh, and then what type of interior attack works or doesn't work for that. Again, you'll see a focus on interior attack for these experiments because we've uh, done a lot of exterior attack through the other experiments, but we also need to provide some sort of comparison using the same structure, same fuels. So uh, single room of fire, single window open. We did some transitional attacks with that. And then again, two rooms of fire also with a transitional attack. So suppression tactics and hose line advancements. <coughs> We asked the technical panel when they came uh, to our first meeting and we were designing the experiments, how do you guys apply water? What suppression methods do you use? What does it look like? And the room's just dead quiet. <clears throat> we said, we need some input. We need to know how to do these experiments, how to put the fires out. What do you want us to do? Again, nobody said anything. So we said, go back to your department, take your best crew and film them doing a suppression method. Uh, in a burn building with no fire so we can see what's going on. Have them mask up at the door, have them go in, flow water, make a turn, flow water, suppress. And uh, lo and behold, we came out with two tactics uh, that can, uh, most of the tactics in the United States can be boiled down to these two based on the departments we looked at. The first one being a flow and move. What we call a flow and move is when the uh, nozzle operator goes inside the building and decides he's going to open the nozzle, that nozzle stays open until he's in the room. So he is flowing while he's moving. He's going to get to a place where he decides it's hot, I see this, I need to flow water, he opens it, then they advance forward while they're flowing uh, all the way into the fire compartment uh, to complete suppression. This is the method this department and six or seven others on the technical panel did, again spread out throughout the United States. Then we had also what we called a shutdown and move. That's what, again, we bucketed it into. But the departments had fairly similar masking up procedures. The outside stuff would all look the same. They'd go inside the building, but instead of opening the nozzle, keeping it open and advancing forward, they would get to a position, they'd flow, they'd shut down, they'd advance forward, they'd uh, open the nozzle again, flow a little bit, shut it down, and move forward. Uh, from all the input on the technical panel, everything was bucketed into those two tactics for interior. For transitional, this is what many people in the panel uh, defined as a transitional attack. I'm going to get up close, keep my stream max because I know that gives me greatest surface coverage. I'm going to wait until the fire darkens down. We're going to pop the front door. Then we're going to come over and transition to the interior. Now I'm going to be going down the hallway and deciding the same thing. Do I need to flow? Do I not need to flow? This is up here as modified transitional attack, but this is just something that we've seen and uh, based on water distribution, we saw that we didn't get water into the middle of the room. So if I'm able to be at the same grade as the fire compartment and I can get up to the fire compartment, what happens if after I do my transitional attack, I get up to the window and I start applying water inside because I know I need to wet the fuels in the middle. What does that look like? What does it mean to a victim in the hallway? What does it mean to a victim in the back bedroom? Then again, the crew transitions to the interior. Uh, with that, we go into some of our results. Robin will start us out with the first couple and uh, see how many we can get through. Hello, you've heard enough from me today. We'll start again. Uh, so the, <coughs> the most two challenging tactical considerations, oh, I'm gonna skip over that one. Tactical considerations that we uh, came up with really focused on the victim because that's one of the big things as I said in my presentation, they focus on in the U.S. You guys saw this slide earlier, where there are definitely survivable spaces inside the house when the fire department arrives. <clears throat> so what does that lead to? 
That leads to the thought where we can make things go better or we can make things go worse. We have the option to do that now. There is the potential that you could make things worse for someone inside that structure. So one of the big things in the US is that the fire environment, uh, when you suppress, you create steam. And that steam causes burns to victims. We put those laser measurement te techniques in, and, and all the lasers measuring we did, we realized that when you put water on the fire, you're not actually increasing the moisture in the environment. Why? Because the fire environment is wet to begin with. If we look at just the simple, simple chemical equation for the combustion of methane, we see that part of the products are water vapor. So smoke has moisture in it. It's also at a high temperature. The higher, a gas is, the higher temperature the gas is, the more moisture you can fit in the gas. If it's cool gas, you can't fit a lot of moisture in it. On the left, you see a measurement that we did in two experiments at the one foot level. And you notice black lines here are where we applied water. We are not seeing a drastic increase in moisture inside the compartment. Equate this to a sauna. A sauna is somewhere around 5% by volume moisture content. So this particular location, less than a sauna throughout the entire fire. So probably not having an issue with moisture there. The moisture, isn't it heading to the, to the ceiling? It is. So that's why you're not seeing it there. Yeah, but can you still measure it then? So that's, that's the like, next slide. Okay. The next slide, <laughs> or the next uh, <laughs> chart, is moisture at the uh, five foot level in the space. And we see that it's a lot higher. First of all, we're getting readings all the way up to about 11%. When we apply water, it's not necessarily seeing jumps. This experiment 10 line is actually one of these down here. That jump is before water is applied. We're not really seeing jumps, and after water is applied, things kind of tail off. That up there at the five foot level was already so wet because of the smoke that had, pro that had moisture as one of the products of combustion in it, that you physically couldn't get any more moisture in it. So even though you were spraying 325 liters a minute of water into that structure, it can't become a gas and be trapped in the gas because it's just not enough room. It drops out as condensate. So uh, fire, and also the other point to point out is look at how much this is increasing prior to some of the water applications. Well over what we saw at the one foot level, meaning that's about when the smoke gets there. We did a quick look, it's not very scientific, but hey, what time did we see the layer of gases come down to the sensor? And about every time we saw the layer of gases come down to the sensor, we saw the moisture spike. So, it was more relating to how high in the space you were and how much of the smoke you were in. Burn injuries. There's a huge thought that you can apply water and it's going to cause an injury to a person. So we took a look at this skin measurement, which you saw a little bit in the video. This is the first time anything like this has been employed. There are some correlations uh, for pig skin burns to human burns. Um, and that's why pigskin was used in this experiment. So we had to take the pigskin and have a known thickness to it. We measured that thickness and it's about the uh, equivalent of the epidermis here, of the skin. Uh, the dermis layer and then the subcutaneous fat would be mimicked by these uh, rubber blocks that had about the same thermal capacity as human fat. And then blood flow behind it was done by a water bath at as close to 98 degrees as you can make it. When you're talking about measurements in the fire environment, they're difficult to begin with. And then you try and take water and constantly heat it to 98 degrees, and that becomes even more difficult. So that is relatively 98 degrees. Used fish tank heaters got it pretty close, um, but we didn't want to burn up the fish tank heater every time, so it got pulled out just before the test. But we do measure that water temperature throughout so we can understand what it's, what it's doing for us. The other thing we can do is we can take a look at the depth of burn damage by using a one-dimensional heat transfer equation to look at how far the heat penetrated through. At about 47 degrees Celsius or so, it starts you, in your skin, you start to see damage to that skin. So if we develop a 1D heat transfer model, we can have a model for how that energy is moving through the skin, and at that depth, we can tell you at what depth it reached 47 degrees Celsius. It's kind of a little bit uh, more complicated than that, but that's the, the simplest we can make it. And then we can use that depth to say, did it go through the, was it only in the epidermis, was it only at the surface, 
Did it get into the dermis? Was it a second degree burn? Or was it in the subcutaneous layer? Is it a third degree burn? There's also a fourth degree burn, which is a complete burn through. Um, however, it's very subjective to where on the body the skin is, because some skin is thin and some skin is thick. Your back has thicker skin, the surface of your hands has thinner skin. So third and fourth degree is very, very relevant. So uh, one of the things we uh, took a look at was, as you apply water, do you increase the damage of the skin? And essentially, we saw that as you apply water, we do see some skin damage increases, but it never went through the surface of the skin. So we have two hypotheses to why this occurred. The first is, it wasn't a long duration, so it was only a first degree burn like you would have for a sun sunburn. Uh, the second is, you're actually putting hot water on top of the skin. Because when you throw 300 liters a minute down the hallway, and there's the package of skin laying at the end of the hallway, it's soaked when you're done with it. And when you put water into a hot gas layer at 600 C or so, and it falls to the ground, it's probably higher than 47 C by the time it gets there. I mean, it's, that's, that's quite a bit of water to throw in. So we did see some increases, but not uh, massive increases in those. And we never went from a no damage to a, uh, a first degree burn or a first degree burn to a second degree burn as we, we went through. So, uh, so here's an example of that. We have, when we spray water down the hallway, we see the skin damage <coughs> increase, but it's only the surface of the skin. It does not get into the depth of the skin. When we apply water from the outside, to the, and there's a victim laying right outside the door there, we were seeing increases before. We apply water, and it increased a little more, but then it leveled out. We apply more water, it increases again, but it levels out but a value of one over here on the right would be going through the surface skin, so being more than a first degree burn. And that was in a first degree burn before you applied the first amount of water and it never exceeded a first degree burn after you applied water. So it's there, it's happening, but it's, uh, it's not necessarily uh, causing more significant <coughs> damage to cause problems. So what do you compare this to? Well, you compare this to if you do nothing, right? If you do nothing, uh, and on the left here, I've got uh, the victim one location, and on the right here, I have the victim three location. Um, and if you do nothing, you see that the surface of the skin, right about 15 minutes, we have this massive increase in the surface, and then it's just constantly increasing the skin depth damage. This is depth in millimeters from that point on, just continuing. Very similar on the, one, the victim that's on the bed, you know, it's a little slower because it takes a while to get energy to the room where the victim was on the bed. However, once you started that increase, it wasn't until you applied water until that increase slowed down and decreased off. So it's not increasing, increasing this, the uh, subcutaneous depth of the skin damage. <coughs> so we boil that all down. Uh, and we want clean takeaways, right? The fire service always wants yes or no answers. So the best I can do in the research that we did was lump everything together and say, how many times did I have no damage to the skin? How many times did I have first degree before I applied water? And then how many times were they no damage in first degree after the water? Look at that, they're exactly the same. If you run through the chart here, there are only probably one or two small spots where we do see it increase. We go back in and look at the data and it was increasing before we applied the water. So we just happened to apply water at the right point in time as it's increasing, so it jumps from one to the other. It had nothing to do with the actual application of water in doing so. Um, but the takeaway for me is, if we do something, we have a big impact on it. Because when we look at this chart here, this is us doing something at that vertical line. If we had just let that go, assuming the rate's gonna continue at the same amount, you're going to continue the damage, right? Same, same thing here, you just can't, can't actually see the, uh, the tail of it though. If we do nothing, it's gonna increase. If we do something, it's most likely gonna be exactly the same. The challenge to that is, is what do you do now? And we don't really have an answer for that. Because even after water, they're still in there, in a hot environment, in really toxic gases. So what do we do? Do we drag them out? Or do we break all the windows out and let all the hot gases out? What's faster? It's a great question. I don't know that answer. What's more effective? It's also a great question. I don't know that answer. Luckily, I'm going to be able to study that coming up next year. So we're going to be doing this exact same thing. And we will look at those to try and uh, correlate the answers between them. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Keith so he can uh, wrap up for you.
Uh, one of the interesting pieces to add in, and he may have mentioned it, I may have just missed it, uh, with the skin burns is that when we did see an increase on the victim at the end of the hallway, commonly it was because the water droplets that we're using in our streams are so large, our water droplets pass through the hot gas layer. They come in contact with the surface, cool the surface, and then drop out. So at that point, we have hot droplets. So some of the increases that we saw at that victim location were purely because they were getting hit with hot water. So then again, do you want to get hit with hot water or do you want to be burned by the fire? All things to consider. Uh, water in the fire compartment matters. We know this by this point, but this is taking a look at tactics. Again, this was our structure, fire in the bedroom here. We do an interior attack with hall suppression. The blue shaded area here is uh, the duration of our water flow. The blue line here is how much water we used. So again, in US units here for gallons, but this was the duration of the nozzle on, and this is how much water was flowed. You can see for the duration of the water on, we were doing a flow and move attack. So we get to the beginning of the hallway here, we open the nozzle, we know we need to cool as we advance, we keep it on the whole way to the fire room and complete suppression. These are bedroom one temperatures, which is the fire room itself. You can see there's quite a delay in the temperatures decreasing. Why is that? Now we go back to water distribution, pull some pieces from that, and we know that we can't get water into the room until we're at least halfway down, two thirds of the way down the hallway and can get water in. When water gets in, then we see our drop. <clears throat> Compare that to a transitional attack. Well, I know that I'm applying water directly into the compartment from the very second my nozzle is open. So what do I see? almost an instantaneous drop in temperatures in the fire room. Again, as we would expect, but just to put the numbers to it. Temperature reduction. So we take a look at interior. This is again back to the interior attack. These are the bedroom, uh, one, bedroom one temperatures. You can see the delay in reduction uh, based on how the tactic was applied. Uh, interestingly enough, obviously you see at the end of the hallway, as soon as we open the line, we're getting cooling because our stream is hitting that location. Uh, going to bedroom two, which is the bedroom across, we can see that we do get a reduction in temperatures in there, just a little bit slower. Transitional attack, again, just taking a bigger look at the picture. Uh, we see that the bedroom one temperatures, instantaneous drop, I'm applying water into the compartment. End of hall, again, fairly instantaneous because it's just outside the fire compartment. And again, uh, drop in bedroom two temperatures, even when I apply water from the outside over here. Uh, one thing to point out here is you see the temperatures start to increase. We'll talk about regrowth here in a couple minutes if we get to it, hopefully. Uh, but regrowth is important and our speed of transition is also important because I know that I can't hit the fuels in the middle of the room. This was an attack where I didn't go up to the window and put the nozzle in the window. So I know that my max angle is coating the surfaces. I take the uh, flash over and fully developed out of play, bring all the gas temperatures down below 200 C. But then as time goes forward, the bed's still burning. It's going to increase again. So again, it's about putting water on the fire, how quick you can get it there, and how you can go about doing that. If you get water where it needs to go, you don't need much. Robin touched on this this morning, so we'll go through that quickly. Um, so again, for us, uh, 257 gallons was the most we used out of all the experiments. For us in the United States, presenting that to United States firefighters, that's very much a shock. Uh, so we pull up to the scene with at least 500 gallons, very commonly 750 or 1,000. We're always taught, I need to stop at the hydrant, I need to hook up to the hydrant, make sure I have continuous water, then I'm going to go to the scene, and then I'm going to make sure I never have any problems with water. This is just to emphasize that you can do a lot with what you're already coming with. Again, more fire, more water used, as you would expect. Uh, more ventilation, more fire, more water use. Uh, interior attack, you're using more water. Why is that? We know we need to cool on our advance. We can't just march down the hallway to the fire room and then put water on it or I'm going to get burned before I get there. Uh, you saw this this morning for cooling as you advance. Uh, again, more ventilation, uh, more fire, more uh, water used. Flow and move uses a little bit more than shut down and move. Obviously, I'm keeping the nozzle open. I'm going to use more water. Uh, water can impact the flow path, so this is something we haven't seen yet. <clears throat> we can see here fire again in the master bedroom. The interior attack crew is coming in, turning down the hallway, and they're starting to flow. Again, I see the duration of my flow here. I know it's a flow and move. The nozzle's open the whole time. This is actually taking a look at velocities in the hallway. So right here at the start of the hallway, we had velocity probes, just like we used in our air entrainment experiments. We want to see what happens to the flow in the hall based on what our tactic is. 
we see that if we keep that nozzle open, and again, keep in mind I'm doing wall ceiling wall, so I'm coating the surfaces, it's a very narrow hallway, so when I do a wall ceiling wall, it's almost an O, because it's very narrow when it comes down and almost touches. I'm basically occluding that whole hallway and occluding the fire gases from coming back behind me and out the door. I'm basically sealing off the hall. So you can see here, all of the flow drops to zero, meaning I don't have any flow behind the nozzleman as he's moving forward. Taking a look again at another set of experiments uh, where the fire was actually coming out of the fire compartment now, so now we have a vent. What does that mean? Does that change anything? Can I still seal it off? Uh, we have more fire. Uh, taking a look at the front door, this is looking at front door flow, and then again hallway flow. We see as soon as the nozzle's turned on, the flow's dropped to zero. I'm actually occluding the hallway and flow path with my nozzle and my hose stream. Might be a little bit hard to see based on how bright it is, but again, this is the second scenario. We have fire coming out of the bedroom one window. The front door gets forced. We're doing a couple second door read. What is my neutral plane doing? What's the smoke look like? The crew enters in. We're going to get to the beginning of the hallway and we're going to start to flow. As soon as we start to flow, you'll see it and it'll be brief, but pay attention to the smoke coming out of the top of the door. You're not going to be able to see the hose line jump, but you'll be able to pick it up in the smoke. As soon as the water starts to flow, smoke production stops at the door. Again, keep in mind that we have two thirds of the house to the right of this, a living room, a dining room, a kitchen. So as we get further down the hallway, that smoke will eventually start to exhaust out, but you can very clearly see the impact of the flow with our host stream. Uh, taking a look at flow and move versus shut down and move. Uh, we'll touch on this just very quickly. Again, flow and move, looking at the hallway temperatures. We're seeing that we're having immediate temperature reduction and the temperatures stay down. Uh, in our shut down and move case, as you would expect, as soon as we shut the line down, we haven't put the fire out yet. The pump is still churning. We're still having hot gases come back over us. This is what we're seeing there. And again, just comparing amount of water usage. Uh, okay, so this is another set where we're looking at the actual bedroom temperatures, just highlighting again that I'm not actually having cooling impact until I get further down the hall. Cooling as you advance. So Robin touched on this morning uh, the UTEC chart, as we call it, for our operational zones for where a firefighter can and cannot uh, um, be inside the building based on the fire conditions. We see that when we don't have a vent, the fire room, the firefighter obviously can't be. Just outside the fire, fi uh, fire room, the firefighter could be for a little bit of time. And then the, uh, the entry and the beginning of the hallway is uh, fairly routine operations. When we have a vent in the room, we have a little bit bigger fire. So now that, um, that category extends out into the hallway a little bit. And then uh, this condition carries further down. Again, the more fire you get, the more hazardous it is further away from the fire. During interior suppression, we can see that we control the environment very quickly, and as we're applying water, we're making that a safe environment, and it stays that way based on our tactic. During exterior suppression, we actually see the same thing. So I'm not inside and applying water down the hallway, but when I apply water from the outside in, I'm actually seeing improvement in the conditions uh, in the hallway further remote from my suppression. And that leads us to search and rescue with fire suppression. There's a um, talk in the United States about do I need to search before suppression? Should I search with suppression uh, or afterwards? Uh, this is basically just highlighting, showing you that you're improving conditions, whether you're doing it from the outside or the inside, uh, whether it be exterior uh, transitional attack or interior, and I should be able to search the building while I'm doing that. So there's a lot of pushback in the United States about if I've got people on the outside of the building flowing water in, Nobody else can go inside the building yet because we don't know what's happening. I don't want fire to get pushed on them. Again, it all goes back to our outstanding arguments, what we're trying to uh, prove or disprove. And we can show that conditions are made safer regardless of the tactic you're doing. So get inside and search the building, find any victims that may be there, going back to skin uh, burns and any potential uh, lethal concentrations of gas. The quicker they're out of the environment, the better. So what we saw for that was that we were getting our temperature reduction and obviously you could seal off the hallway. So the fog stream can create issues in other parts of the structure potentially, uh, but based on the experiments we did, you're still seeing an improvement in conditions. 
Uh, but again, the majority of our experiments were designed with either a straight stream or a smooth bore. Uh, and then lastly, we'll finish up with this one. Uh, speed of transition is the enemy of regrowth. Uh, so this is a transitional attack on the outside of the building. This uh, room is right adjacent to where the front door is. So you go in the front door, get to the hallway, turn left, and it's the first room. We can see here, this is over the period of one minute. So the suppression is conducted at the window, the fire darkens down, the crew gets up, goes into the building, and within 40 seconds, or even less, the, they have fire returning in the room. So visually from the outside, it almost looks the same. Again, we see more fire coming out here, but <clears throat> in the United States, they would say, oh, transitional didn't work, the fire came back, and look at how quickly it came back. So why am I even gonna do it? I need to get in the building and get to my victims. Uh, and then you see, obviously, we get in and we complete suppression via the interior attack. But the important takeaway is the temperatures. Whenever I conduct that exterior attack, I see my drop in temperatures. Uh, and the key takeaway is that what I may see visually may not be there as far as temperatures. So I'm seeing fire return. I still have smoke in the room. The bed is still on fire in the middle of the room. Visually, I'm seeing what may be a lot of fire but the conditions inside the room and outside the room are not nearly what they were before the attack. So yes, I have temperature return, but it may be about 200 degrees, and it's nowhere near 1500 what it was before the attack. So again, it's all about our perception. <coughs> Visual may be different than what is actually going on. Uh, and with that, we'll wrap up. I know it's a lot of information. Appreciate you guys sitting through it. Uh, it's tough to blast through all of this stuff and give you the background and build on it as we go. But uh, hopefully you had enough coffee to stay awake and. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm here if you have any questions. If you need to leave, feel free. Yes, sir. Sure. So we did uh, one third of the experiments with the window closed and the whole building tight. We did another third with the window open, and then we did another third with two rooms and two windows open. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. So we, uh, we only tested the fog nozzle once, uh, or twice, I should say, and it was always with the vent open ahead of us. Uh, so we haven't done the experiment yet where the window's closed and we're doing a fog pattern because the assumption and perception in the fire service is that if I have a fog nozzle and I'm occluding, you know, you saw in the video this morning when you apply a fog stream to a window, look at what happens at the other end. What happens if that window's not open? Am I going to build pressure and it's going to burp you know, burp back over me. I was doing the suppression. I didn't want to do it. Uh, that still needs to be done. We haven't done that. We saw it was very effective with the window open. If the window was open and I went to a fog, I didn't even need to move it. I occluded everything and it was a very easy attack. So, uh, but again, most of the uh, suppression in the United States is done with a straight stream or a smooth bore. They never turn it to fog. Uh, so most of them were done that way. Uh, <clears throat> maybe, hopefully. Uh, Robin touched on it briefly, but this is the first year that we've been funded more through our company instead of grants. Uh, up until this point, everything's been by grants, and it's uh, United States funding. They want to see United States tactics. So, yes, sir. Does the new president influence your funding? Possibly. We'll see. It's the first year, so we'll see. I don't know. I'm not going to talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the grants are up for reauthorization in our country, so they're authorized at a three-year level each time, and then this year is reauthorization. So we'll know if they get reauthorized or not. It really has not as much to do with him as it does with the Congress. So uh, they have said they want to reauthorize them, but they can say whatever they want until they actually reauthorize them. And, won't have and reauthorization doesn't mean that we get one. We still have to apply, and it's still a very small pot of money, and there's still a lot of firefighters that don't like what we do. So if they're reviewing it, we're not going to get it. So we'll see. Mm -hmm.